Good morning, my name is Aaron Fields, um, and this video is for INFA 725 Advanced Network Hacking with Dr. Inga Britson. Um, so, this is the final video for the class, um, and it's going to be about roughly an hour, uh, hopefully, of lecture as well as demos, um, followed by an assignment, um, which I think will be pretty sweet. Um, so this talk is based loosely off of the book Practical Malware Analysis um, by No Starch Press. Um, and so yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about me and uh, this lecture. Uh, so I've spent my whole summer, the past two and a half months, uh, reverse engineering software and learning how to reverse engineer it. Um, mostly non-malware software. Um, so that's a little bit different than reversing straight up malware. Um, but yeah, each day, eight hours a day, I am up to my eyeballs in IDA Pro, um, debuggers, and some other custom instrumentation tools. Um, so this talk is going to be based primarily off of what I learned this summer, um, but for places where uh, I have knowledge gaps, I'm going to be drawing off information in the book. Um, and there's a lot of good information in the book, too, that just kind of uh, helps back up what um, I've learned. So. This talk assumes that you have moderate experience with uh, C and assembly language. Uh, you don't have to be able to write assembly necessarily, but you do need to be able to read it. Um, it's really not terribly hard to learn how to read. So, I mean, if you just go on Google, spend some time on Google, um, you should be able to get the gist of it before too long. Um, <clears throat> so, it's, it's really impractical, if not possible, for this lecture to be a comprehensive guide to reverse engineering software. Um, so it's really just meant to give you enough information to complete the assignment. Um, so like this is really just a small fragment of the reverse engineering universe as a whole. Um, there is way, way more uh, information out there regarding reverse, reverse engineering, lots of other techniques. Um, so yeah, this is just a small sliver. Um, so this is going to be kind of what our outline looks like. We're going to talk a little bit about why we would want to analyze software, um, how do we analyze software, and we're going to talk about some uh, just kind of like high-level, broad strategy for reversing software. Um, and we're going to talk about disassembly and um, how people have tried to uh, fight back against disassembly um, with some anti-disassembly techniques. And then kind of the same thing for debugging. So we're going to look at some debuggers. We're going to look at some ways that um, people try to uh, mess the other stuff or um, even exploit them. Um, and so the final assignment is going to be, um, you're going to get a program that I wrote. It's just a very simple uh, program written in Visual C++. It asks for a password. You type in your password, um, and it checks to see if the password is correct or not. Um, so what you will need to do is um, the program... When you get it, it will be packed, and we'll talk about packing a little bit later. Um, but you're going to need to unpack the program so that you can properly disassemble it. And then once you can disassemble it, you're going to need to figure out where you need to patch the program so that it always accepts whatever password you throw at it. Um, and once you, once you have the program in that state where you can type in any password and it will accept the password, um, then you have completed the assignment. I also noticed that there's a typo um, on this uh, slide. There probably will be more typos throughout this talk. Um, that's what I get and that's what you get for me uh, not having Microsoft Office and the wonderful spell check that they include with their products. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, so yeah, let's talk about why we would want to analyze software. Um, so I believe that uh, software analysis kind of started out uh, with people, software crackers, right? Um, people started charging money for software, and they started implementing protections to keep people from pirating said software. So think about, like, license keys and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, hackers, crackers um, decided that, no, like, we don't want to pay for your software. And so... They uh, developed tools like Polydebug, which really was developed primarily for cracking software, right? So figuring out uh, what the license mechanism is in a piece of software and um, 
you know, just knopping it out or cracking the software so that you can activate it without a legitimate license fee. Um, so that's where we got tools like Ollie.Debug. Um, and incidentally, uh, it's kind of part of why tools like Ollie are pretty unrefined and they don't always work the best. Um, they were written by hackers for hackers, and so they are uh, not well developed. Uh, in Ollie is not actually under active development any longer. Um, as we'll see later in the talk, um, Ollie's actually somewhat buggy, and you know that's just uh, that's just the way it is. Um, there are some other tools out there too that we're going to be using, and they're just there's some sketchy tools, right? I mean, they were they were probably written by a dude living in his grandma's basement. You know, it's uh, it's a very uh, hacked together software. Um, so that's one reason that we would want to analyze software, is to crack it and then patch it so that we can use it without um, paying for it. Um, right, but like we don't do that because we're, we're students and um, that's, that's wrong. Um, but it's still cool to know how to do um, and just kind of get a little bit of the history of uh, software analysis. So the other reason that we might want to analyze software is just for knowledge, right? Figuring out how this software works, what is it doing, um, especially in the case of malware, you know, who wrote the software, um, you know, was it another nation state, uh, you know, kind of just figuring out what's going on with the software. Um, a lot of times it's really interesting to look at software um, because you'll see that the software is phoning home. Um, even commercial software will phone home back to um, its, you know, its uh, developer servers. And so sometimes it's nice to know what information they're sending back to the server um, because, you know, it could potentially be an invasion of privacy. And uh, if you know what you're doing, you might even be able to patch your software so that it doesn't phone home anymore. Um, so yeah, these are just some of the reasons that we would want to analyze software, um, not necessarily all of the reasons, um, but some of the primary reasons that I have encountered. Um, so, yeah, let's talk a little bit about static analysis or disassembly. Um, so disassembly is a process of breaking down like a, a binary executable um, that contains machine code into human, decipherable, human decipherable assembly language. Um, so probably the most popular disassembler is the Interactive Disassembler, um, or IDA Pro. Um, so this is, uh, by and large, the best uh, disassembler out there. Uh, the word interactive means that it doesn't do everything automatically. It's an interactive process, um, which means that you can, as the user, um, you know, edit what it's ed edit the assembly language it's spitting out at you. Um, you can rename variables, um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's an interactive experience, as we'll see later in the IDA Pro demo. Um, so there are two very cool add-ons that I've used uh, with IDA. Um, the first is called Hexray's Decompiler. So a disassembler gives you assembly code. Um, a decompiler will actually give you a sort of C source code. Now it's, it's not perfect, and sometimes it's messy. Um, but really, the newest versions of X-Rays actually do a pretty good job of disassembling code, especially if you can spend time um, renaming variables, renaming functions, um, and just cleaning up the uh, raw assembly that IDA gives you. Um, if you can clean that up and then decompile it, uh, the C source code that you get looks much cleaner, it's much more understandable, and it's really helpful. Um, Another <laughs> newer addition to IDA, um, it, IDA doesn't come with it by default. Um, you have to buy both of these add-ons, actually. But another, another cool one is um, IDA Python. Um, so it basically provides um, a Python API to interact with IDA Pro. And so this is sweet because it allows you to uh, script uh, large processes. Um, it allows you to automate a lot of things that you'd normally have to do manually. Um, just very cool. Unfortunately, uh, I don't have a personal copy of IDA Pro, um, and so we're not going to be able to mess around with either of these uh, add-ons today, but they're still good to know about. It's good to know that they exist. Um, if you have 
ever have the opportunity to work with them, I would definitely advise you to take the time and learn about them. Uh, if you're ever um, having to spend time reverse engineering a piece of software, these two add-ons can make your life a lot easier, can make your job a lot quicker, um, and certainly more enjoyable. So, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, in IDA, you can rename functions and subroutines. Um, you can rename variables. You can group basic blocks. Um, you can fix arrays, and we'll, I'll explain what that is in just a little bit. Um, but the long, long story short, you want to spend time doing all of these things, cleaning up the assembly, um, so that the code is readable by you and other people. Um, you want to do it for your own sanity, right? So that when you uh, if you're ever disassembling a very large program especially, um, it helps you keep track of what part of the program is doing what. Um, and it, yeah, it just keeps you from going insane. Um, and like I mentioned before, it's, it's very useful for hex rays. It uh, cleans up the output of uh, hex rays a lot. Um, so just some other... Uh, little tricks to keep in mind before we get into the demo here. Um, basically, three of the quickest ways to get a preliminary idea of what a piece of software is doing um, or where you might need to dig to find what you're looking for is uh, viewing the strings, viewing the imports, and viewing the exports of the program. So viewing strings is pretty, pretty straightforward, right? Um, in IDA, you can just open the strings view and uh, look at all the strings that IDA has found in the program. Right? So if the developer of the software that you're analyzing ever said, you know, print the hello world, you'll see the hello world string um, in the strings window. You can then click on the string. It'll show you where the string resides in the program. And then you can view cross-references to that string so you can see where it's actually being used in the program. Um, so uh, for the assignment, you're definitely going to want to keep this in mind as it will... Uh, Definitely, definitely speed things up for you. Um, I'll, I'll cover this a little bit in the demo, too, uh, just how to uh, make use of strings. Um, so another important uh, piece of information is the imports table. Um, so the imports table shows you uh, what functions uh, the piece of software that you're analyzing is importing from other DLLs. Um, and so, especially in regards to like the Windows API, it can give you a very quick idea of what the executable might want to do. Um, so if you're seeing imports um, from crypto libraries, uh, it's likely that the application is probably encrypting something somewhere. Um, if you're seeing imports from, you know, uh, you know WinINET.dll, um, you can probably suspect that at some point the program is going to connect to the internet and send or receive information. Um, and so you can also, uh, like the strings, you can double click on uh, the functions that it's importing, that the program is importing. Um, it'll take you to the import table, and then you can view cross-references to see where those functions are being used in the program. So again, very quickly, it just helps you uh, figure out where the program is doing important stuff. Um, and exports. So. If uh, you can import functions, you can probably export functions to other applications as well, right? Um, so viewing the exports is also uh, important as it can give you an idea of what other programs might want to use the executable that you're analyzing for. Um, and so especially if you have debugging information that IDA is able to add into the program, you can see the names of these functions. Um, and so sometimes you'll see things, you know, like, uh, you know, format XML, right? And so you can guess that, that at some point, if that function is called, it's going to probably format XML data uh, so it can be, you know, put into a database or, or something like that, um, right? And so you can, you can uh, yeah, just get a quick idea of what other programs might use this executable for. Um, and also, if you uh, spend some time uh, doing some scripting and uh, really getting familiar with IDA and the Python API, it is possible to kind of create a, uh, a map of um, how, say for example, you have a large program with lots of DLLs 
um, you can kind of get an idea of how all of those DLLs are related to one another, right? So you can look at um, the exports of all the DLLs and then look at the imports and see which DLLs are using other DLLs and just get a kind of a mesh of how they all um, work together. Um, so just some common uh, useful IDA shortcuts. Um, these are probably the four shortcuts that I use the most in IDA Pro. Um, semicolon will allow you to insert a comment on a line, right? So this is good because then we can remember what that line is doing um, when we come back to it later. Um, if you select a subroutine or a variable um, with the cursor and press N, it allows you to rename that subroutine or variable. So again, you know, using descriptive names is helpful just for you uh, to keep track of what's going on in this program. Uh, another very useful shortcut is X. So if you highlight a subroutine or a variable um, and press X on it, it will pop up a window showing you all of the references to that variable or that subroutine. Um, so this is very useful. If you're looking at a subroutine and you press X, um, you can view every place in the program uh, that IDA is able to recognize, at least, every place in the program where that function is called from. Um, also, escape. Um, so you're clicking through functions, you know, digging down deep, um, and you decide all of a sudden you want to go back. All you have to do uh, is press escape. It'll take you back to whatever window you were previously on, or it'll take you back through um, the chain of subroutines that you just clicked through. Um, and so, so you'll see me using uh, these shortcuts uh, when we get to the demo. Um, and so one other important thing to keep in mind, too, is that if you see brackets around a, va a value, um, it means that that value is to be treated as a pointer. Um, so LDA uh, stands for load effective address. Um, so what it's uh, on this bottom line here, what's, what it's effectively doing is loading um, a pointer to the variable source into ECX. Um, and so we'll see that uh, later when we're going through the demo. And I think if I remember right, um, this might uh, this might come in handy just to you know, have this knowledge as you're um, reversing uh, the, uh, the the assignment uh, program. So, <clears throat> general strategies for software analysis, right? Um, executables, even though they might only be 17 kilobytes, which seems small, they're huge once you uh, disassemble them. Um, and if you ever have to analyze a piece of software that's a couple megabytes in size, you're going to be like, good grief, um, you know, I'm, I'm never going to get through this. And so you really need to just start with a high-level view of the program, right? Don't get caught up in the nitty-gritties of each, you know, move so-and-so into EAX. Um, so don't get snagged in the detail. Um, one of the best strategies that I've come across is to just look at Windows API calls. Right, so you dive into a subroutine, you look at all the calls in that subroutine. If you see a call to a Windows API, you just make note of it. Um, because a lot of times what you'll see is a function with a bunch of calls to, um, you know, socket, uh, socket functions, uh, you know, HTTP request functions, etc. And so what you can do is say, well, uh, this function is definitely interacting with the Internet. And so you can just name that function, you know, Internet sender or internet getter or whatever, right? And you don't even have to worry about all the little nitty-gritties of um, each individual assembly instruction right now. If you need to later, you can narrow down your scope. Um, you know, for example, in a crypto function, uh, when you're first analyzing the program, you might just name it, you know, crypto function one, right? And you know that it does crypto, but you don't take the time to figure out exactly how the crypto is working because at this point, you know, early into your analysis, you don't know if this function is actually important um, or actually relevant to your analysis or not. But if you need to come back later um, because you've determined that, yes, this, this function is very important, um, you know, it's encrypting all the data that they're sending out. So if I can reverse this, um, I can, you know, uh, you know write, a, write a key gen or uh, write a decryptor or something like that to decrypt this information, you know, then then that's useful, right? But you don't want to get caught up in that right at the beginning of your analysis because if it turns out to be something that 
is not actually relevant, then you've just wasted a lot of time. Um, so, yes, you want to make sure that you document your work well. Um, like I've said, you can rename functions and variables in IDA. Um, you can add comments. Um, and I would suggest even taking actual notes on pieces of paper. Um, just helps you keep track of your thoughts well, helps you keep track of what is doing what in the software, what parts might be important, what parts aren't important, um, because you can't remember it all. Um, at least I can't. So uh, with that said, um, we're going to talk a little bit about anti-disassembly, um, and then we'll get into our demo. Um, so first, a little bit about how disassembling itself works. Uh, there are two basic strategies to disassembly. Um, one is linear, uh, and one is called flow-oriented. And flow-oriented is what IDA uses. Um, so linear disassembly basically takes a buffer of data and just eats away at it. It assumes all the data in that buffer must be um, instructions, and so it just breaks it up if it, you know, assumes, you know, chunk one is an instruction, chunk two is an instruction. Um, just plows through it. Um, the problem with this is that not all data is always an instruction. Um, and so that can cause problems sometimes. Um, keep in mind that linear uh, disassembly is used by most debuggers. Um, so flow-oriented flow disassembly is just a little bit different. Um, it starts eating away at the buffer. Um, but it pays attention to what it eats, right? And so um, say it sees a jump to a certain uh, place in the code. Um, it keeps track of that, and it, it builds a list of places that it needs to disassemble. So it doesn't just plow through the buffer byte after byte after byte. It keeps track of a list of places that it needs to disassemble, and it'll assemble um, those places in the list um, as, it <laughs> as it feels comfortable. Um, and so this is a little bit better, a little bit smarter, but definitely more complex um, than linear disassembly. Um, and yeah, we're, we're going to take a look at some ways to uh, to, to break this now. Um, okay, so there are about <coughs> six uh, primary techniques that are outlined in the book um, as far as anti-disassembly techniques go. Um, so we're just going to kind of pound through each one of these six here. Um, the first is something called conditional jumps to the same target. So this is where um, the author of the program that you're attempting to disassemble has um, put a jump zero XYZ um, followed by a jump not zero XYZ. Right, so XYZ is the target of the jump, and you'll notice that it's the same in both of the jumps. So if you look at this, uh, you know, think about it for two seconds, you'll realize that this jump is going to be taken no matter what. So even though there are two conditional jumps, it's really one unconditional jump, right? And the disassembler doesn't realize this, and so it continues to disassemble the code immediately following the jumps. Um, so if you look at <coughs> um, these, are, pretend these are instructions, right? You've got a jump, a jump, and then you've got, you know, a byte of data or whatever, and then you've got the target of these jumps, and then you've got more data. And so what happens is, no matter what, one of these jumps is going to take us to this T, and that's where execution will continue, no matter what. Um, but the disassembler doesn't realize that, and so um, even though it records the target, XYZ, for disassembly later, um, it doesn't disassemble it right away. Instead, it continues to disassemble at this rogue byte, D, um, and the problem is that that rogue byte never actually gets executed in the program. Um, and so effectively what happens is that the, the T, the target, gets hidden. Um, and so, yeah, the disassembler will interpret the D and the T and the D and the D and the D um, as entirely different instructions from what they really are. Right, the next technique is very conditional to, or very similar to uh, the previous technique. Um, <clears throat> so conditional jumps with a constant condition. Um, what you'll see is something like XOR, uh, you know, register EAX, followed by a jump 0, XYZ. Um, and so this jump is always going to be taken because the XOR operation sets the 0 flag. Um, but IDA doesn't realize 
that the jump is always going to be taken. And so it continues to disassemble right after the jump, just like the previous example, even though the jump might be, you know, pointing to uh, the middle of, um, you know, the instructions and, and, you know, there may be a rogue byte, um, like in the previous example. Um, so yeah, that can cause problems. Um, another thing uh, that is common is something called impossible disassembly. Um, so that rogue byte that we talked about, right? Um, in the previous two examples, it just never gets executed. Um, however, what if it does? Um, what if that byte is part of multiple instructions? Uh, then we have this problem um, where disassemblers have no way of representing a byte as being part of two separate instructions. Um, and so what you'll see is, you know, you'll have four instructions, right? The first two are a jump to the two, um, right? So a two-byte jump instruction jumping to the number two in this set of four instructions. Um, and so the two is part of the two-byte jump, but it's also a part of whatever instructions make up, you know, the sequence of two, three, and four. And, and disassemblers just simply do not know what to do with that. Um, we need a completely new and different way of displaying uh, assembly code in, in order for that to, uh, <coughs> to work. Um, and so what you will see sometimes, though, or at least what I've seen, is uh, when you run across this in a debugger, um, at least in immunity debugger, uh, you'll actually all of a sudden see um, all of the code in the disassembly window, like, change. Right, when, when the jump occurs and it jumps to the number two, um, I don't know if it re-disassembles the code or what, but you'll see all of the code, the assembly code change to represent the fact that you're at this different offset and, and that the instructions should be interpreted differently. Um, so yeah, just a, just a little random tidbit of information, I guess. Um, so yeah, this has caused me... Um, Function pointers have caused me a, a, a few headaches um, in my experiences. Um, so what you'll see in IDA um, is something along the lines of like a move variable 6 into EBX followed by a call EBX. And so in this case, variable 6 is a pointer to a function. Um, however, you don't know what that function is because it's not like a call subroutine 42, right? It's, it's calling a register. Um, and so what you'll have to do is, you know, trace that variable 6 back to its origin and figure out what the value of um, variable 6 actually is. Um, and there's no way for IDA to automatically follow those, those calls. Um, so this is where some of that interactivity uh, comes into play. Um, Sometimes you can trace variable 6 back manually in IDA, but oftentimes you actually have um, to run whatever program you're trying to analyze in a debugger um, and, and look at these calls dynamically uh, just to see where they're pointing to. Um, and what's even more fun is when uh, variable 6 contains a different value every time um, it's called. Um, so that you know, causes even more headaches. Um, so I've seen this a lot in, like, large, you know, kind of modular programs with lots of DLLs. Um, what they'll do is, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how exactly, uh, but they will load memory addresses into, you know, for example, variable 6, um, memory addresses that point to functions in other DLLs. And so they'll just call these unnamed functions in other DLLs, um, and it's really just kind of, Kind of a nightmare. <laughs> um, so, anti-stack frame analysis. Uh, this is this is interesting. Um, so, what will happen is uh, the way that the assembly is set up, uh, it will trick the disassembler into thinking that the stack pointer is a value that it will never actually be um, in you know real live execution. Um, so, when you're looking at the code statically. Uh, you know, IDA will think, oh my, ESP is absolutely, you know, huge, when in reality it will never actually be that huge. 
Um, so what you'll see is uh, a conditional jump with an unconditional comparison, like we talked about earlier. Um, and so one path of this conditional decision right, adds a large value to ESP. Um, the other uh, path uh, of the condition does not add a large value. And so often, th most of the time, right, uh, the path that adds a large value to ESP never actually gets executed. Um, the other path that does not add the value does get executed. Um, but the disassembler doesn't realize that the large value will never be added to ESP. And so um, it, it's just like, holy cow, um, our stack pointer is huge. Um, and this completely messes up hex rays because um, it looks like to the disassembler that there are dozens, if not hundreds, of arguments to um, you know, this given function because the stack pointer is far larger than it should be. Um, but when you, when you run the program, right, you'll find out that there are not hundreds of arguments to said function. Um, and so you, you can fix this manually um, in IDA um, just by realizing that, okay, you know, this, uh, <coughs> this large value is never going to be added to ESP um, and just, you know, making changes to the assembly accordingly. Um, and then, you know, then it'll fix the output, it'll fix hex arrays, um, and get you some, you know, code that's cleaned up a little bit. Um, and so the last, uh, last anti-disassembly anti trick that we're going to talk about is something called packing. Um, and so this is not only anti-disassembly, it's also, like, anti-antivirus. Um, so it, it'll hide things from antivirus, generally speaking. Um, and basically what packing is, uh, you have a program called a packer, um, and so the one that uh, I used for uh, the assignment is called UPX. Um, and so what, what UPX does is it takes a regular executable, and it compresses that executable, um, and it can encrypt it. Um, and the packer will spit out an executable stub with the original, uh, you know, packed, uh, compressed data appended onto this stub. Um, and when you run the executable that the packer spits out, the executable stub at the beginning of this new executable unpacks that packed data at runtime into memory. Um, and then once that data is unpacked into its original, you know, format or state, you know, it's decompressed, it's decrypted, um, execution is transferred to the original entry point of, of the real executable. Um, so, this is, uh, packing is used a lot in malware, um, because it, you have to figure out how to unpack, um, the malware before you can even analyze it statically. Um, and so that, that can be a pain. Um, and like I said before, too, it also, uh, it, it can also, it can hide, uh, malware from antivirus, even though now, um, most antiviruses detect um, the packing process. Um, and so if you pack something like even Notepad, um, right, completely non-malicious, or, or so we hope, um, but you pack it and you upload this packed Notepad to VirusTotal, um, I believe over half of uh, the AVs that VirusTotal uses or tests against will detect Notepad as a malicious piece of software. Um, so that's using something popular like the UPX packer, um, but obviously if you write your own custom packer, um, you'll probably you'll probably get around <coughs> most, if not all, uh, AV. So, so yeah, now it's time for our uh, IDA demo. Okay, so we're going to take a look at IDA Pro. Um, I have installed the IDA demo version, which is version 6.2. Um, it's actually pretty functional, um, at least for examining, <coughs> um, like, any sort of x86 software. So, like, n it'll work for 90% of the stuff that you want to look at. Um, the, biggest, uh, the biggest downside to the demo version is that you can't save any of your work. Um, but I still um, just want to use it just to uh, do a little il illustration of how IDA works. Um, so the program that we're going to be looking at here, just real quick for a few minutes, is called Small FTP. 
it's just a super simple uh, standalone executable FTP server. You don't have to install it. You just run it. Um, so all we need to do to open this up in IDA is drag and drop a small FTP executable onto the IDA icon. And you'll, be pre you'll be presented with the uh, load new file window. Um, unless you're doing something crazy, which is pretty rare, um, you don't actually need to change any options on this window. So I just hit OK. IDA will do its processing. Um, you'll hit no on proximity view, and you'll be presented with what's called a graph. Um, so this thing that you can uh, drag around is called a graph, and it's one of the primary features of IDA Pro. It allows you to easily or more easily visualize um, the flow of the code. Um, so it's just dropped us into the start function, uh, and You'll see a few calls in this function. Um, I'm not sure what set app type is, um, but here's a call to another subroutine within this program. So over on the left here, we've got this window full of <coughs> what looks to be gibberish um, at first. Um, but this is a list of all of the functions in the program. Um, now, Ida has been able to find names for a few of these functions. Um, if they are the functions have like a kind of a pink background. It means that they've been imported from some other uh, library. Um, so IDA does the best it can here. Um, but like I said, a lot of these don't have names. And so IDA just automatically names them sub underscore and then the address where that function is located in the executable. Um, so what we can start doing here is just double clicking on the target of the calls. Um, and start, you know, wiggling our way through this program. Um, so I, I'm just going to double click on this call to subroutine 401080. Um, and you know, it says get main args. I'm not sure exactly what that does, but it sounds like something that a program would do towards the beginning of its execution, getting command line arguments or something like that. Um, you know, and we can click through these and... Uh, you know, work our way through the program just from start to finish, um, like, you know, kind of following uh, the program's regular execution. However, uh, that can be pretty tedious, and so there are a few things we can do to kind of speed up this process a little bit uh, as far as getting to the information uh, that we're interested in. So we don't have a particular target in mind uh, for this FTP server, um, but I'm just going to show you how I generally get to the portions of code that I'm interested in. Um, so, first we're going to start with exports. This is a regular, uh, you know, 32-bit executable. It is not a dynamic link library, and so it only has one exported function, um, and that is start. So, nothing terribly interested he interesting here. However, uh, if we go to the imports tab, um, we can see that it's importing quite a few functions, um, primarily from the kernel 32 DLL and also the MSVCRT uh, DLL, which I believe uh, is like a C++ um, library. Um, maybe it's just a regular C library. To be honest, I don't remember. Um, but we can also see down here that uh, it's importing functions from WSOC32. Um, and so we can see a, a connect function, a closed socket function. And so you know we can be pretty certain that this is probably doing something um, you know, regarding networking, which makes sense because it's an FTP server, right? Um, so probably one of the more useful views in IDA that I that I use most frequently is the strings view. Um, so you can go to view, open sub views, and then click strings to get to this view, or just press shift F12. Um, and so it'll bring you to a window like this. Uh, with a bunch of strings, it'll tell you the type. So these are just C strings. Um, one thing I like to do is right-click in this window, hit Setup, and then check the Unicode box. Um, and sometimes that'll give you a few more strings. Not too many more in this particular uh, program, but oftentimes it will pick up more strings that have been encoded using Unicode. Um, so yeah, we can just kind of uh, browse through these strings. Sometimes there's more strings in this. Other times there's fewer. Um, but you just kind of take your time and dig through here until you see something that is 
interesting to you. Um, so here's like a user login and a user password. I think what I'd like to do actually is look for, um, this is what I was looking for, FTP commands. Um, so what we can do when we find something interesting is uh, select the string that you want, double click on it, and it'll actually take you to um, the dot text portion of the program where this character array is stored. Um, and so Ida has actually already uh, found these arrays, given them names. So in this case, the u this string uh, that has you know the value of user, um, Ida has named it string two. Um, I don't like that name because I don't know what it means. And so I'm going to press N after selecting str2 and rename it to user. Just hit enter, and now it's renamed. And anywhere in the program where user is referenced, it'll say user instead of str2. We're going to do the same thing for pass, just for kicks and giggles. Um, so user pass, this is how you, these are commands that you send to an FTP server in order to log into it. Um, and so I'd really like to see where in the program um, these strings are used. And so what I can do is uh, actually select um, this char user, uh, it's, it's a comment, right, But um, that Ida added, uh, but I can select it, and I can either do um, xrefs2 or xrefs from. I don't think xrefs from is going to give us anything in this case. I will try to show it to you later. Um, if I do xrefs2, it's going to pop up this graph of uh, kind of a chain, chain of events of functions uh, that end up referencing this user string, right? So way up at the top here, we've got the start function. It calls the next function, which calls the next one, which calls the next one, et cetera, et cetera, until we get down to function 40, 22, 24, which actually references um, this user string. Now, the funny thing about these uh, graphs is that you can't actually click these subroutines to follow them, which kind of sucks. And so what I generally do instead of right-clicking and doing xrefs2, um, I just select uh, the, the variable and, <coughs> sorry, I have a cold, um, select the variable and hit the X button on the keyboard, and it'll pop up this screen, uh, which allows you to actually, you know, select the reference that you want and hit OK. So when you hit OK, it takes you to the place in the code at which that string is referenced. So we can see here, uh, user, a pointer to user is getting pushed onto the stack. Um, and then a, looks like a string compare is getting called. Um, and so what I'm guessing is that this LP string is probably um, sent, to, sent to the server by the client. Um, and this chunk of code basically checks this string to figure out which command, you know, uh, user, pass, type, um, you know, STOR, size, to see which command it actually matches. Um, so I'm just going to rename this variable, just so we can keep track of it, um, command. Okay, so I did that just by selecting the variable, pressing N, and renaming it. And you'll notice that everywhere that that variable is referenced also gets renamed. Um, so this is very cool. It allows you to uh, definitely organize the uh, code a little bit and make more sense of it. Um, so we can kind of dig through here a little bit. Um, looks like if um, if user or if, if the command does match user, um, it'll pop us down here to this function. Um, if it doesn't match user, it'll pop us over here to pass um, to see if it matches pass. Um, and so it looks like, yep, for every command, there is a different function that's being called. Um, and so, yeah, you just kind of dig through here, make some high-level sense of the code. You don't worry about every little, you know, add ESP 10 hex, at least not right now. That might, that might be important later, but, you know, like, and this, this code isn't even particularly um, messy, really, but, um, you know, you just, you don't get, you don't get caught up in the nitty-gritties. 
Um, just figure out what the code is doing and then uh, label it as such. If you're not sure what the code is doing in your name, you can put a question mark. So I'm pretty sure that this is, uh, you know, like the command decision tree um, or command switch. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. Actually, I'm pretty sure. But I'll put a question mark there, right? So just, you know, do whatever you need to do to uh, keep track of what code is doing. Um, and so if you didn't catch that, what I did right now was just rename um, rename the current subroutine that I'm in. Um, so I was going to show you the xrefs from graph, and basically that's just like xrefs2, except instead um, you gener generally get a bigger mess <laughs> uh, of a graph than you normally would. And what this does is Ida will... Uh, search through this subroutine for any calls, and then you know it'll it'll list all of those calls right here, at, you know, kind of on the first level, and then for each of those subroutines, it'll search through for any calls and just keep going through, um, you know, kind of doing a oh, what's the correct terminology? Is it breadth first traversal of all of the calls? I think would be kind of uh, the correct terminology, um, and. And, and it, it'll come up with this graph, right, showing the relationship of uh, all these subroutines. So this can be useful. Um, all of these, you know, pink subroutines are uh, imported functions. And so, you know, like we see write file is down here. Um, you know, that could be interesting later, especially if this was malware, um, which, you know, we hope it's not. Um, but... Yeah, so that is the uh, quick and dirty, nitty-gritty basics of um, Ida Pro. Um, I think that's about all I had for the demo, um, but we will be using Ida Pro a little bit later um, in the assignment. So now we're going to talk a little bit about debugging. Um, so first, before we start talking about this, you need to know a little bit about how, uh, just a little bit about how the Windows OS uh, is kind of set up. There's, there's kind of two sides to the OS. Um, there's the kernel side, and then there's the, the user land side. Um, and so just know that we're going to be sticking around in user land for this, the rest of this talk and um, for uh, the assignment as well. If you start getting into something tricky like rootkits and stuff like that that actually install themselves in the kernel, um, then you'll need to mess around with uh, kernel debugging and whatnot. Um, but over on the uh, right here, we've got kind of a diagram of how uh, a, a Windows Windows uh, 32 application interacts with the Windows API. Um, so let's say that we've got a program that wants to uh, write to a file. What that program will do is uh, import a function from uh, kernel32.dll. Um, generally, this function is well, this, this function is called write file, right? Um, so when the program wants to write a file. It'll call write file from kernel32.dll. Kernel32.dll will call nt write file, which is located in ntdll.dll. Um, ntdll.dll will uh, cause a, a software interrupt. Um, and when that happens, everything kind of switches over from uh, user mode to kernel mode. Um, and so <coughs> there is a function called nt write file in uh, nt, ntos kernel.exe, um, which is basically the main like Windows executable that kind of drives everything in kernel mode. And so if you open up, you know, task manager and look at their list of running processes, like you won't see nt, ntos kernel.exe, um, um, but it's it's there. It's running in the background. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, so that's kind of a pretty vague description of how um, Windows works, right? There's this long chain of uh, calls from one DLL to another um, until it finally gets to the actual, you know, like, s system, uh, the core system of Windows, which does the actual writing to the file. Um, so hopefully that made some sense. Um, there are... Three debuggers out there, which um, I've used quite a quite a little bit, um, some more so than others. 
Um, I'm sure that there are other debuggers out there than just these three, but these three are by far the most popular. Um, so the first uh, that I just wanted to spend a couple minutes talking about is called uh, Win, Win DBG, uh, also called WinBag. Uh, just a little bit easier to say, I would say. Um, so this, this debugger is developed by Microsoft. Um, and even though when you open it up, it looks really plain and it's not colorful, it's really not that pretty, this debugger doesn't suck. Um, it's actually a very solid debugger. Um, and the great thing is that it's still under active development, so like it's still getting updates, uh, which is good. Um, so this debugger is primarily command line driven. It's got a little command line in the GUI, and you type commands in there to you know set breakpoints, um, you know read and write memory, um, etc. Uh, so the the big strong point of uh, WinBag is that it supports both kernel and user mode debugging. Um, so to debug the kernel of the Windows operating system, you actually need two computers. Um, you need one, which is uh, the, the client machine, which you are debugging. Um, and then you have the server machine, which is the debugger. And you have to, the easiest way to do it is just to uh, set up two virtual machines and add virtual ser serial ports to each of the machines and connect those machines together using virtual ser serial ports. Um, the client machine, you boot, boot up Windows in debugging mode, um, and then you can debug it using the server machine. And so the reason you have to use two machines is because when you're debugging the kernel, um, if you ever pause execution, the whole operating system freezes up, um, and you can't do anything on the client. Um, so that is why you need another machine to actually control the client. Um, but you can do user mode debugging as well with uh, WinBag, which does not freeze up the whole system. So the next two debuggers um, uh, are both user mode only debuggers. You cannot do kernel debugging with them. Um, so Ollie version 1.10, um, probably still one of the most widely used uh, uh, debuggers out there, uh, was originally created for software cracking slash patching. Right, so we talked about, about that a little bit earlier. Um, you know, people don't want to pay for software, and so you crack it, you patch it, and then you don't have to pay for it. Um, there are a lot of solid plugins for Ollie, um, things like Ollie Dump, which allows you to dump a process's memory to executable format on the disk. Um, you know, there are plugins to uh, help uh, help to hide the debugger's presence. So if you're running into anti-debugging techniques, uh, you can attempt to circumvent the anti-debugging. Um, but yeah, Ollie is, Ollie is kind of old. It's somewhat buggy. It's not very pretty. Um, and it's, there's actually a, um, there's actually a, I think it's a buffer overflow vulnerability um, in Ollie. You can visit that URL for more information about that. But um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not a good deal. <laughs> um, the final debugger, which is my personal favorite, um, is Immunity, Immunity Debugger. Um, so it is based off of Ollie. Um, Immunity Incorporated actually like bought the Ollie source code, uh, I'm not sure how many years ago. Um, but yeah, Immunity basically is Ollie, except for with prettier colors. I believe they fixed the buffer overflow. It's a little bit more stable. Um, and the really sweet thing about Immunity is that it has a Python API. Um, so this allows you to quickly and easily script and automate a lot of things that you would normally have to do manually in the debugger. Um, so like setting breakpoints, um, a really cool thing that you can do with the Python API is set uh, callback functions. So for example, if you set a breakpoint on a certain place in the program that you're debugging, um, you can set a callback function on that breakpoint as well. So when that breakpoint is hit, you can actually have your own code run um, and you know dump values out of memory to see what is going on at that particular instance, um, you know, or do any number of things automatically. Um, so it, it speeds up the uh, the reversing process and the information gathering process uh, quite a bit. Um, the only downside to Immunity is that uh, there aren't as many of those solid plugins for it. Um, so I have yet to find a memory dumper that works well with Immunity. 
Um, I found one, it's called Ollie Dump EX, um, that works okay, but not perfectly. Um, and so for the assignment, we're actually going to be using Ollie simply because um, it has better, uh, better plug-in support for adding extra functionality like um, dumping memory. Um, so yeah, here are some of the things that I found useful in Ollie, and this applies to immunity and, you know, really kind of all debuggers, um, but uh, breakpoints, obviously, are kind of the uh, core of a debugger, right? Um, they allow you to stop the program ex from executing um, at a certain point, so you can basically pause a program while it's executing, like, like a VCR, right? Um, except for... Generally speaking, you can't rewind. Um, so there are three types of breakpoints. There are software breakpoints, hardware breakpoints, and memory breakpoints. Um, so software breakpoints, uh, what the debugger will do is, if you know where you want to break in the program that you're debugging, you, and you set a breakpoint there, the debugger will actually replace whatever instruction is at that address with uh, the hex value of 0xcc, right? And that stands for an int3, int so an interrupt3. Um, and when the debugger uh, hits that, uh, it'll pause and, you know, wait for you to do whatever you want to do. Um, and so software breakpoints are more or less the easiest breakpoints to use. Um, they're kind of like the default in the, in the debuggers. Um, but they can be... Uh, they can be messed with by anti-debugging techniques. Um, and so there are hardware breakpoints. Um, and so the, the CPU actually has a few registers on it, uh, which are called debug registers. Um, you can set up to four hardware breakpoints on the x86 architecture. I'm not sure if it's any different on 64-bit architecture. I honestly don't know. Um, but you can set up the four hardware breakpoints. And so basically what happens is the debugger puts a value um, into uh, one of these registers, and if the instruction pointer ever matches one of those values, uh, execution will pause, and you can do whatever you want. Um, so this just makes it a little bit harder sometimes for um, the program that you're debugging to uh, keep itself from being debugged. Um, and so the final kind of breakpoint is uh, a memory breakpoint. Um, these actually, I believe, use the hardware registers, hardware debug registers um, to function, I believe. Um, but what you can do is you can select a section of memory um, in, in the program that you're debugging, and uh, the debugger can break whenever that memory is uh, read from written to or executed um, or accessed. So you can choose, you know, based on one of those four options when you want, uh, when you want the program to pause execution. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely get into breakpoints a little bit more later. Um, the executable modules window uh, is very useful. It allows you to see what uh, libraries and DLLs the program you're debugging has loaded into memory. Um, and it also allows you to see the addresses at which those modules are loaded. Um, there's another feature in both Ali and Immunity uh, where you can search for um, commands in the program. You can also search for strings. You can also find references to a particular, um, you know, function, or um, you can even essentially run strings on the program like we showed earlier in uh, Ida Pro. Um, Learning the keyboard shortcuts is super useful. It saves you a lot of clicking and mouse moving. Um, and so that's just something you need to uh, take the time and learn on your own. Or if you don't take the time, you'll learn them eventually just because you'll get so cl sick of clicking. Um, and the final thing that is uh, amazingly useful is just add-ons and plugins to uh, these debuggers, right? So like I mentioned earlier, Ollie Dump for Ollie, um, for dumping memory. Um, you know, Immunities, Python API for uh, automating stuff. Um, just really great uh, tools or add-ons. Um, and just one random pro tip that I, uh, that I found this summer is if you ever have to debug a Windows service, it can be a bit of a pain. 
um, to actually get the debugger to uh, attach to the service at startup. Um, but it turns out that Windows actually provides a very easy way to um, do this. Uh, there's an ex executable called gflags, um, which is included um, in the WinBag like suite of tools that you get when you download it from Microsoft's website. Um, so what you do is you just open up gflags, switch to the correct tab, um, which I'll show you how to do this in just a second. Type in the name of the executable um, that you're interested in debugging, um, and then check a box, put in the path to the to the debugger that you want to use, hit OK, um, and then start the service. And when you start the service, it'll start uh, the, the debugger that you specified at the system level, um, and then the debugger will actually start um, this, the executable for the service. Um, so I found this very useful because uh, Windows services can be a little bit fickle um, to actually debug. So let's just get into uh, uh, the debugger demo here. Okay, so we're going to take a look at um, that same FTP server, uh, this time just inside of Ollie Debug. So you just drag and drop it onto Ollie, and it pops open, and uh, the debugger will stop at what's called the program entry point. Um, and so that's not really important right now, but it will be important later when we're unpacking uh, that password program. Um, so debuggers are pretty straightforward, right? You can <coughs> single step through instructions, or you can step over. So, for example, this call, if I step over it, all the code inside of that call gets executed, but I don't want a single step through it. Whereas this call, this, this second call, if I step into it, right, it, it jumps us into that code, and we can single step through it. Um, now, let's say that I accidentally um, stepped into some code that I didn't want to, uh, it's pretty easy to get out. <coughs> I can uh, just click uh, the execute until return button. And so that will just execute through this whole subroutine until it hits a return right right here. And then I just step back um, and we're back into the, the main code. Um, so some cool features of Ollie, right, just to get you a little bit familiar with it. Um, right, I, I mentioned that you can search for strings. Um, so this is very similar functionality to what we saw in IDA. Um, if you right-click in the code window, hit search for, and then all referenced text strings, uh, Ollie will search through for any strings it sees in here. Um, and so we're just going to try and find... Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, those FTP commands that we saw earlier. Of course, now that I'm actually doing the video, I don't see them. Okay, here they are. Um, so I can just double click on this you know, user string, right? And it takes me to exactly where it's referenced in the program. Um, so right here I can set a breakpoint um, on this instruction. I can hit play to just let the uh, server start up and run like normal. Right, so 
here it is. Um, let's just add a user real fast. Okay, and we'll start the server. And now we'll just uh, FTP into the server and see what happens. Right, so I tried to log into the server, and uh, the program broke, um, or hit this breakpoint, I should say, as soon as I tried to log in. Um, so I'm guessing what we're going to see here is string one user. That's uh, that's uh, what this FTP command was when I sent um, the username. Right, so it's going to do a string compare, see if they're the same or not. Um, we'll step over the string compare. And if we pull up this little pane right here, it'll say this jump is not taken. Um, so it's just going to keep chugging right along to the sub ESP 0C. Right, and then we'll do a call to there. So I don't really care about that right now. Um, so I just let the program play again. Um, <coughs> Our connection got closed, probably timed out. So let's just try logging in again. We're gonna hit that same breakpoint once again. And password, I set it to password. So that's what I'll try here. Notice that we hit the breakpoint again. Right, but this time the command is pass, which makes sense because I'm sending the password. Um, and so this string compare should fail. And now this time the jump is taken. Right, so it jumps us down here to pass. They match. This jump is not taken. So we're going to just step into this function. And eventually here we should see, <coughs> I don't think I wanted to jump all the way in here. All right, so we see the username was loaded into EAX. So whatever function we were just in must have been grabbing the username off the stack. And here's string one, the password. And here are the two parameters that are being passed into this function. Um, and notice that the addresses uh, for these parameters are in different locations. At this point right now, I'm not 100% sure which one is uh, the parameter that I supplied just now through the command line. Um, but, I mean, you can do some more digging around on your own to figure that out, right? But it's pretty cool because we know that the password is indeed password, even though we never actually saw it with our, um, with our eyes when we were setting this up. So that's just a really, really, really quick intro to uh, debugging um, and setting breakpoints in Ollie. Um, so we'll get into this quite a bit more uh, once we actually get into the assignment. All right, and so just real quick, um, before we finish up here, actually, I want to show you um, how to use G-Flags. Uh, so we go into All Programs, Debugging Tools for Windows, and hit Global Flags. Uh, if you come over here to the image file, uh, you type in the name of the executable that you want to change the settings for. So in this case, I'm going to type psanhost.exe, which happens to be uh, the, the service executable for uh, Panda Cloud Antivirus, which I have installed. Um, and the service is currently stopped right now. Um, so I press tab to uh, refresh the screen. I check the debugger box, and then I put in a path to um, community debugger. We'll see if I type that right here. Now we can open up services. the Panda service, right, psanhost.exe. Start it. Yep, here we go. The uh, immunity debugger has started up with the service. And so now uh, uh, the Panda service is running inside of the debugger. So just a quick little trick I wanted to show you guys. Um, so we do need to talk about anti-debugging just a little bit because malware uses these types of tricks all the time to mess with the malware analyst. 
Um, so there are four main categories, uh, the first of which is using the Windows API to detect a debugger. Um, there are a number of functions that can be called which will indicate uh, the presence of a debugger, namely is debugger present and check remote debugger present. Um, you know, if these are turned true, then there's probably a debugger uh, that's debugging you and you should exit, right? Um, NT query information process, I believe for that function you pass it the handle to an executable as well as a flag that indicates what information you want to uh, have returned about the process. And so if you pass it the correct flag, um, NT query information will tell you whether or not the process is being debugged. Uh, the final function is output debug string. Uh, and so this allows the program to send a string to the debugger for display. Uh, if this function returns true, it means that there is a debugger present because a string was successfully displayed. However, if it fails, there is no debugger present because a string wasn't displayed. Um, and so the program that's being debugged can obviously choose to act how it pleases, depending on the outcome of uh, these functions. Uh, there are also some flags that can be checked. Uh, for example, the being debugged flag, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, you can also check the process heap flag and the NT global flag. Um, and a lot of times malware will actually check for running processes. So for example, immunity debugger.exe. If it's running, you know, I won't run. Um, you can also iterate through open windows, uh, et cetera, checking for, you know, debuggers, uh, common names of debuggers, et cetera. And uh, actually the G flags program that I showed you in the demo uh, actually uses registry keys in order to uh, enable its functionality. And so malware can check for registry keys to determine whether or not it's being debugged. Uh, kind of the second category is checking for debugger behavior. So a program can scan through its you know, memory, uh, memory space looking for 0x CCs. Um, because if it finds one, uh, a debugger probably put it there. Um, you can also do code checksums. So you know, taking all of its code or all of its uh, memory, doing a checksum, seeing if it matches a known value. Um, and if it doesn't, then there have probably been some sort of modifications done to the code by uh, the a debugger. Um, timing checks are pretty interesting and pretty problematic for the malware analyst. Um, so what malware will do is, uh, for example, get the system time. You know, and, and it can do that in a number of ways. Uh, you know, using the RDT uh, SC instruction or calling query performance count or get tick count. Um, you know, some way to figure out what the time is. And then it'll do some processing and then it'll get the time again. And if the time between uh, those checks is large, it's likely that the program is being debugged or instrumented in some way. Um, and if that time is you know, too large, the program may decide, yeah, I think I'm being instrumented and then just you know, exit. Um, kind of the third category is messing with the debugger itself. Uh, so there are these things called thread local storage callbacks. Um, and you can tell if a program is using these uh, because it will have a .tls code section. Um, and it's pretty uncommon to see this .tls code section. So if you do see it, you know you're probably looking at a pretty suspicious piece of software. Um, so the thing about these callbacks, though, is that they get executed before any other code in the program. So even before that original entry point where the debugger stops, like we saw in the demo, um, they get executed before that. So the, the, the program could be doing any number of weird things uh, before the debugger even stops for the first time. And so as for the malware analyst, that's, that's not good. Um, another thing that the malware can do is throw a bunch of exceptions. Um, because if the debugger doesn't pass the exception back to the process uh, correctly, the process can use that uh, to detect the presence of a debugger. Um, another thing that's really annoying that malware can do is insert uh, int 3s or int 2ds. So int 3s are for uh, user mode debugging, int 2ds are for kernel debugging. And there's also uh, an Intel interrupt um, called ICE. It can insert these into its executable memory, um, and when the debugger hits these, it'll you know it'll stop. Um, and so that's just annoying for the analyst because. All of a sudden, your debugger stops, and you don't know why, because you didn't set a breakpoint there. 
Um, and yeah, it can be problematic. It can also be used with timing functionality. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the malware can uh, inst instigate a breakpoint um, and then, you know, check the time check to see uh, how long the time is, you know, like, like I mentioned before, between uh, the two time checks and uh, determine whether or not it's, it's, it's being debugged. Because obviously if there is no debugger present and there is a 0xcc uh, in executable memory, you know, it, it, it won't, uh, the process won't pause because there's no debugger to pause it. Final, uh, Final anti-debugging uh, technique involves exploiting the debugger itself, um, particularly Ollie debug. Uh, there are two pretty serious vulnerabilities, uh, which I'm not going to go into explicit detail about. Um, if you'd like to know more about them, you can do some Googling of your own. Um, but the first is a PE header vulnerability. Um, if you modify the PE header of an executable correctly, um, you can actually uh, start or you can actually pull off a buffer overflow um, in Ollie debug. Um, however, if you run this executable with the modified uh, PE header just you know outside of a debugger, it runs fine because Windows uh, does some magic and it can handle this modified PE header. Ollie actually sticks to the standards of PE parsing um, and because it sticks to the standards it gets uh, a little messed up. Uh, there's also a format string vulnerability in Ollie. Um, so you remember that output debug string uh, function that I mentioned earlier? Well, if you pass it a bunch of like percent %s's, uh, Ollie is probably going to crash and die a violent death. Um, so that's about all I had for the lecture. Um, hopefully you learned at least a little something. Um, hopefully it made at least some sense. Um, so now I'm actually going to get into the assignment and just walk you through step-by-step uh, step how to do it uh, so that you can do it yourself. Um, so, yeah, let's get started.